16. Pelagianism and Asceticism Since Chalcedon had blocked one avenue of incursion by paganism into Christianity, other avenues had to be used. The doctrine of God and of Christ had been defined. The new approach was made through the doctrine of man. Already before Ephesus, Pelagianism had allied itself with Nestorius in 429 and the Council of Ephesus in 431, linked in condemnation. The opinions of Nestorius and Celestius Celestius or Colestius, being a Pelagian leader. Pelagianism was pagan moralism and philosophy comparable to 18th century deism in many respects. Warfield has correctly stated, The real question at issue was whether there was any need for Christianity at all, whether by his own power man might not attain eternal felicity, the only function of Christianity being to help man in this self-salvation. The origins of Pelagianism were monastic and ascetic, and they were philosophical. It's important to note the equation of asceticism with philosophy. As Richardson noted, philosophy meant virginity and, in its earlier usages, did not refer to Christian virginity but primarily to philosophical celibacy. The Neoplatonic philosophy of the times, through its doctrine of the purification of the soul by its liberation from the body or sensuous things, taught celibacy and ascetic practices generally. So Plotinus, died A.D. 270, practiced and taught to a degree, and Porphyry, died 301, more explicitly. As Prestige noted, pagan mystics prayed to be delivered from the flesh rather than sin. Hellenized Jewish hermits appeared well before Christian hermits in the Egyptian desert, and there was a Hellenized Jewish colony of hermits near Lake Mariotis. From the 2nd century BC, the immured ones of Serpis lived incarcerated in cells near their god, receiving food through small windows and living and dying in their holes. This pagan asceticism deeply rooted, infiltrated into Christianity. Asceticism is of two varieties. First, monistic asceticism holds to the oneness of all being with gradation and variation. Thus, particularity is an illusion and unity is the goal and truth of being. Spirit is high on the scale of being while matter is thinness of being, so that spirit has more substantiality than matter. The holy man seeks to ascend on this ladder of being from the nothingness of evil and matter to the substantiality and holiness of pure spirit. For Dante, the depth of inferno is locked in ice and darkness and is motionless, close to non-being, whereas the ultimate vision of heaven is the fullness of light, energy and motion, pure spirit, as against pure matter. Second, dualistic asceticism sees reality divided into two hostile camps, spirit versus matter. These two worlds are in confusion. The way to holiness is to disentangle the two worlds and affirm the good world, the world of spirit. Man must therefore surrender, negate or destroy in himself all that which would affirm the evil world of matter. This can be done either by ascetic practices or by debauchery, by treating the flesh as outside the world of law or morality and hence open to any use, ascetic or sensual, which treats it with contempt. Biblical revelation is radically hostile to both forms of asceticism. Matter and spirit are both created by God, both fallen in Adam and under the curse, and both objects of saving grace and the resurrection. The Church, following this scripture, began by condemning the practice and theory of asceticism. If any bishop or presbyter or deacon or indeed anyone of the sacerdotal catalogue abstains from marriage, flesh and wine, 
not for his own exercise, but because he abominates these things, forgetting that all things were very good, and that God made man male and female, and blasphemously abuses the creation, either let him reform, or let him be deprived and be cast out of the church, and the same for one of the laity. Nonetheless, however, asceticism of both kinds crept into the church and brought with it a high view of man and his ability to save himself. As Scott noted, asceticism already, fully developed in the empire among the pagans, crept into the church with monasticism, and the monk needs no saviour. He is a self-redeemer like the Stoic or any other moralist. As Pickman noted, in this faith, there was nothing specifically Christian. Pagan priests and philosophers had held their prestige by similar methods, and even the physicians of that day were expected to be chaste and abstinent during a stated period before administering their cure. A canon of the Council of Tours, held much later in 461, shows that this conception was never eradicated. Priests and deacons are urged to be always chaste for... At any moment they may be called upon to perform some holy office, as to say Mass, baptize, etc. Canon number one. Evidently, asceticism's popular appeal in those days was less on account of its psychological effect on the ascetic himself than of its physical effects on those to whom he ministered. It was the chosen weapon of the humanitarian. That is why, before long, a physician who did not become a monk lost his practice. More than humanitarianism, it was humanism, a belief in the ability of man to divinize himself by ascent on the scale of being. As Polycarp Sherwood has summarized the teachings of St. Maximus the Confessor, deification is the ultimate fulfilling of human nature's capacity for God. In actual historical fact, deification and salvation are the same. This is qualified by the statement that it is possible through Christ and by grace, so that deification is wholly a gift of God and is not attainable by nature's nude powers, but the deification still stands and the human powers are extensive. In Lactantius, the basic premise of asceticism appeared clearly. Those things which belong to God occupy the higher part namely the soul, which has dominion over the body, but those which belong to the devil occupy the lower part, manifestly the body, for this, being earthly, ought to be subject to the soul as the earth is to heaven, for it is, as it were, a vessel which this heavenly spirit may employ as a temporary dwelling. The soul thus belongs to the enduring one and the body to the transient many. Salvation is thus not so much in Jesus Christ as in man's soul. According to Lactantius, Knowledge in us is from the soul, which has its origin from heaven, ignorance from the body, which is from the earth. Whence we have something in common with God and with animal creation. Thus, since we are composed of these two elements, the one of which is endowed with light, the other with darkness, a part of knowledge is given to us and a part of ignorance. Over this bridge, so to speak, we may pass without any danger of falling, for all those who have inclined to either side, either towards the left hand or to the right, have fallen. The balance Lactantius had in mind is between divine philosophy and natural philosophy. It means keeping informed on both sides, but the gap between the soul from God and the body from earth cannot be balanced. The soul is far greater and more important than the body, for it is that which we have in common with God. When Leo the Great opposed Manichaean asceticism and dualism, he did it at times with almost monistic rather than Christian weapons. In denying the Manichaean view of evil, he answered that evil has no positive existence, that is, it is not a metaphysical substance, but rather a penalty inflicted on substance. 
evil thus existed in man not as a substance, but as a penalty thereon. But more than that, evil is not a metaphysical, but rather an ethical condition, not so much a penalty, but rather a moral act and condition which brings on the penalty of God's wrath and of death. Fasting in the Bible appears on a limited scale as a voluntary act and as an expression of concentrated grief or repentance. It now became a good work, a self-restraint which led to spiritual pleasures. It was a means of vanquishing the enemy, an armour in the warfare against the devil. It was and is required in Lent. Lenten fasting is a means of restoring purity. Since Leo's ascetic tendencies, however, were relatively mild, and his general stand was resolutely Christian. In Salvian, regrettably, we find the weakening of the body required, for the health of the body is inimical to the soul. The soul is an attribute which is divine, and the body an enemy which is of the earth. For Gregory the Great, asceticism was a prerequisite to authority. Sacerdotal celibacy was of central importance to him. In terms of this ascetic perspective, matter was equated with a lower and temporal reality with a negligible particularity, and the spirit was equated with a good and eternal reality and unity. This position varied in emphasis from a Neoplatonism to a neo manichaeanism Its consequence was a tendency to despise things temporal in favour of things eternal. But, for Orthodox Christianity, matter and spirit are alike created by God, alike fallen, and alike redeemed. The life of holiness is not living in terms of the spirit and eternity, but obeying the word of God, living under God both materially and spiritually. Time and matter are not to be despised, like spirit and eternity, they are good or evil only in their relationship to God and his word. Augustine, coming out of Platonism and Manichaeanism, was at first showing their traces, struck out against this false view of matter. It is sin which is evil and not the substance or nature of flesh. Moreover, there is no need, therefore, that in our sins and vices we accuse the nature of the flesh to the injury of the Creator, for in its own kind and degree the flesh is good, but to desert the Creator good and live according to the created good is not good, whether a man choose to live according to the flesh or according to the soul or according to the whole human nature, which is composed of flesh and soul, and which is therefore spoken of either by the name flesh alone, or by the name soul alone. For he who extols the nature of the soul as the chief good, and condemns the nature of the flesh as if it were evil, assuredly is fleshly both in his love of the soul and hatred of the flesh. For these his feelings arise from human fancy, not from divine truth. The origin of sin is not in nature, but in will, and sin is contrary to nature, which was created good, and whose property it was to abide with God. Sin is not metaphysical, but ethical. In Scripture, they are called God's enemies who oppose his rule, not by nature, but by vice having no power to hurt him, but only themselves. Sin is disobedience, rebellion, living for oneself as one's own God. Adam's sin as act was preceded by an evil will. The devil, then, would not have ensnared man in the open and manifest sin of doing what God had forbidden, had man not already begun to live for himself.